Um, so without further ado, um, our first talk of the day is um, Introduction to Ecological Forestry by Mary Jane Roger. Um, she's our executive direct director and she manages many of the daily operations here at the MCFC, including forestry operations, planning and supervision. Um, she also does business development, she does a little bit of community outreach, and she also does private woodlot and research consulting. She originally hails from Ontario, um, and she also holds a master's in forest conservation and is a registered professional forester in Nova Scotia. So you, she is also a member of the um, Minister of Lands and Forestry Ecological Forestry Advisory Committee. Um, so that's a little bit about our speaker. I'm just going to take a moment right now just to um, mute everyone, make sure everything runs smoothly, and then Mary Jane, if you want to share your screen, we can get started with the presentation. All right, great. Thanks, Heba. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would just reiterate again, like, I'm just scrolling in the, in the sidebar here, and I see a lot of people who aren't muted. It's very hard when you're doing these things, there's background noise coming up. So um, if, if you could meet, mute your mic, if, if, if possible, that would be great. In the, in the kind of buttons bar at the, at the bottom, it's the one to the far left um, with a little microphone. Thanks. Okay. So give me a second here. Um, all right. Uh, so to start, um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is the first in our series, um, in our public intro to forestry series. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about ecological forestry. Um, this is specific really to our operations at the Medway Community Forest Cooperative. Um, that's not to say that this isn't aligned with some of the, what the, what, where the province is going with ecological forestry, but this is really specific to what we try and practice here at the MCFC. So I wanted to give some of the individuals without um, a background in, uh, with the MCFC, a bit of a overview of what we do here. Um, so we are a community forest um, and being a community forest, we act to have a government structure that is directly managed by our community members. So they're involved in our forest management decision making. Um, our forest land base, so our Crown Land License Area, it supports a diversity of economic opportunities. Um, sorry, I don't think, uh, I can't see my mouse, which isn't happening, helping in terms of getting rid of that side uh, little bubble there from, from WebEx. So I think we're just gonna have to deal with it. Um, so in, 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 being, in being supportive of a diverse uh, economic opportunities, we're not tied to the operations of any one mill. We sell lumber on an open market um, and we take into consideration some of these other values. So, uh, the multiple interests that exist in our community, whether it be recreation, um, non timber forest products, cultural values, there's a lot in in forestry that isn't often considered on on regular crown land management that we really try and capture within our everyday operations. And finally, we aim to demonstrate and encourage a high level of environmental stewardship in our operations. So we kind of go above and beyond what is uh, required of us as a Crown licensee. So it's worth mentioning too that we are a member-based co-op. Um, anyone can purchase a share for a one-time fee of $25. So it's really uh, a negligible amount for having some sort of say in, in how this land base is governed. So, um, where are we located? So we are a 15,000 hectare license area in Annapolis County. So we're just kind of over the Queens Annapolis County line and we consider our key community as Caledonia. 
Um, and we are nestled in this network of parks and protected areas. So we're adjacent to Kejimakujik National Park, the Tobiatic Wilderness Area. And um, what we see in the yellow there is the new-ish uh, Medway Lakes Wilderness Area. Um, there's also like a, a network of nature reserves um, such as Snowshoe Lakes, Porcupine Brook, um, Skull Bog. There is a variety of different nature reserves in the area because we are in this, um, the Southwest Nova Biosphere Reserve, um, which is a UNESCO uh, heritage site. So we have a lot of concentration of species at risk and it's really integral that our forestry operations exist um, to complement this network of parks and protected areas. So, in our management, we operate largely, um, of course, we, we, are, we follow all of the regulations um, for us as a Crown Land licensee, but we've also de developed an independent management plan. Um, so we partook uh, in our management planning in 2016, had extens extensive um, consultation with our stakeholders in the community um, to develop management practices that were reflective of our membership. Um, so some of these special management recommendations that are kind of above and beyond is we have additional precautions for species at risk. Uh, we implement a silent season for migratory birds. So that's during the month of June. So right now we actually have one of our staff members who's doing regular, regular migratory bird uh, count so so we're actually looking to measure uh, the amount of migratory birds within our license area while we're not doing any operations. Um, we've implemented larger buffers for water courses so in partial harvest we've extended um, the required buffer that's 20 meters on crown to 30 meters. We've also increased or sorry decreased uh, clear chi set clear cut size limit. So generally we don't do a whole lot of clear cutting in the community forest, but if we were to have a stand where it was ecologically appropriate, it would not exceed 15 hectares or the general area of the stand, um, which often never exceeds 15 hectares. Um, so we also have a special management zone for parks and protected areas. So within 500 meters of parks and protected areas, we don't conduct any sort of intensive silviculture or forestry, though that'll be, that's also, you know, never really an option on our license area anyways, but it's good to have it in writing. And then we also have amendments to the provincial guidelines that actually dictate the prescriptions that happen on our license area. So these are known as the forest management guys. So we have specific deviations in there that basically allow us to promote more Acadian forest restoration rather than uh, intensive or plantation style forestry. I really wish I could get rid of that box, but it's too bad. Um, so to dive into my talk today, um, ecological forestry has been a practice that we can um, so I can hear a little feedback on someone. Um, sorry, uh, Dave of some sort, your mic's on. I can see you in the screen. Um, hi, um, could you please turn your mic off? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so ecological forestry has been something we've been practicing for our entire the entire duration of the community forest so we've now been in business for over five years and all of our practices have been based on principles of ecological forestry and ecologically based forest management um so this photo here is just a a great representation of some of the research that we're doing in implementing ecological forestry so this is on a a block that we did a research trial with the Department of Lands and Forestry um, to test whether um, a lighter touch approach was appropriate in a spruce pine stand. Um, so you can see that we're testing, you know, to the right there you could see a strip cut and then in the middle that's actually our irregular shelter wood and then to the left is what would traditionally be applied on crown land, um, which would be a seed tree harvest, which is a type of clear cut. So there's a key foundation or definition of ecological forestry that's basically 
uh, we're practicing ecological forest management to emulate the outcomes of natural disturbances. So we're aiming to restore or sustain complexity and diversity in actively managed forests and maintain ecological function post harvest. So our overall aim is to emulate the disturbance regime that is most ecologically appropriate to the natural stand condition. So that could be a little wordy, but I'm going to unpack it a bit in the next few slides. So how can we determine what is natural? And this is a really challenging question because when we look at a forest, we might think, oh, this is how this forest has looked forever. But often that's not the case, especially here in Nova Scotia. So we can define natural as without human influence. Um, and that's coming from Malcolm Hunter, who's kind of one of the leading or gurus of ecological forestry or triad forest management. Um, and what he stated basically is that it's really difficult to distinguish what is natural in a heavily human influenced landscape. We also have to consider that forests are naturally dynamic and they're constantly changing to adapt to new conditions. That's with or without human intervention. And in the Acadian forest, we've really seen that little, if any, forest area has escaped human influence over the past four centuries centuries and there's been a general shift towards younger, often even aged, what we call early successional forest types. So in this photo here we see a late successional forest um, that's comprised of trees that are likely that are likely somewhat natural. We see old growth hemlock, some old growth pine, and also like a structure that isn't clean. It is is uneven age and has a large representation of down woody debris. Likely this is from Hurricane Dorian. We see some natural regeneration coming up on the forest floor. So this is kind of what we're looking at as what would be natural uh, without human intervention. So to dissect a few of Nova Scotia's primary natural disturbances, Wind is definitely our dominant disturbance agent in Nova Scotia, which primarily creates small openings within the overstory. Most often our wind events are low to medium intensity disturbances. We're not really, we don't have a whole lot of hurricanes, though they do happen. So we have these intense wind events that can create larger openings or stand replace what we call stand replacing disturbances. So basically flattening the entire forest stand. These can especially occur in exposed areas that are dominated by shallow rooted trees. So here is a picture I took on the MCFC license area following Hurricane Dorian. And we can see here there's a mixture of pine, poplar, um, so that would be large tooth aspen, um, oak that has been completely leveled. And, and what you can't see in this photo is this is on the south side of a lake and is actually in an area that we we harvested, so we did a partial harvest in about a month before. So those trees didn't really get a chance to respond to that, what we had already introduced as kind of a major change within the stand when we took out about 30% of the overstory and then it being exposed and having the shallow rooted species like the poplar um, pretty much leveled part of the stand. So that's what we can look forward to, especially with climate change um, happening more often in years to come. So fire has also been a dominant human caused disturbance agent in Nova Scotia post-settlement. Um, so fires do occur naturally here, um, although they're typically characterized by small scale, low intensity fires. Um, there is evidence of low frequency. So we're talking um, greater than every 500 years, having large stand replacing events um, occurring. What you can't see there is pre-settlement. So Large fires do occur in Nova Scotia naturally, however, they're not very common. And very few fires, so less than 1%, that's the wrong way around my, my greater than sign there, um, they're caused by lightning strikes. Um, so we're looking at a really, really small percentage versus what you might see in the boreal forests where a lot of fires are caused by lightning. Um, we also have a different fire dynamics here because we have these mixed wood species. So we have a high um, proportion of deciduous species, which don't 
usually allow for these kind of intense crown whole tree fires that you see um, in the boreal forest as well. So then we also have to consider that fire suppression plays a large role affecting the natural dynamics of fire in the Acadian forest. Um, so while we are having, while we do have more fires post-settlement, um, they, they are generally quite well controlled. Um, and we have new estimates that indicate that these naturally occurring fires um, happen on return intervals of every 250 to 600 years. Um, so those are your lower intensity fires, but happening at, you know, kind of a, a moderate frequency. Um, and that's from Anthony Taylor's research, who he's conducting um, most of the natural disturbance regime uh, peer review study for the Department of Lands and Forestry post Leahy review. So next um, is native and invasive pests and diseases. Um, so we have a variety of forest pests here in Nova Scotia um, that pose a significant risk to individual species. Here I've showcased some, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that this fire photo, this is also in our license area and that was from the Seven Mile Lake photo that happened in uh, 2016 and that, that was human caused. So to start, um, what we have right now in our license area is like a few native uh, pests and, well, quite a few. And then we also have a couple invasive pests. So primarily the hemlock woolly adelgid, which unfortunately you, you can't see in the photo due to the WebEx um, viewer, but it's under, they have these small woolly egg sacs that basically over time defoliate hemlock trees and it's a significant, it's going to be a significant impact to hemlock populations within Nova Scotia. Spruce budworm is a big risk um, as well as beech has a variety of pests. Beech bark disease has been here in Nova Scotia for quite some time, but now we have the beech mining weevil that's coming in and essentially will um, increase uh, total mortality in beech trees. We're seeing a lot of resilience from some, um, from beech bark disease. Oak, we see threats from gypsy moth, oak leaf shredder, and that's this photo of the canopy to the left there. That's oak leaf shredder on our license area. Maple, we see a lot of sugar maple borer, mossy top fungus is what we see on the bottom right there. Um, and nectar target canker. So those directly implicate the future quality and health of the trees. Um, and then if, also for hemlock, there's our malaria root rot, which essentially will rot the bottom of the tree from below and hemlock borer. So these are naturally occurring, um, though a lot of them are influenced by human being moved by humans throughout globally throughout the world. So Hemlock woolly adelgid is native to Asia. Um, so we have to look at things also in, in a human influence lens um, of what we've derived from the landscape and what would be here naturally. Um, there's a great resource with the link I've put to the bottom, which I will share the slides afterwards, um, a Woodlot Owner's Field Guide to Pests of the Acadia. Forest, which gives a really great analysis from the Department of Lands and Forestry of some of the common pests that we see in Nova Scotia. So what does this all mean? Let's, let's try and put this together. So say we've had a forest that's been significantly disturbed by one of these agents and it's in the process of regenerating. So this is kind of forestry 101, what we're talking about here is shade tolerance. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I'm trying to not get too jargony on you guys. Um, so what we're looking at in this diagram is basically the succession of a forest over time. So if a stand replacing event were to occur or a large scale disturbance, Basically what happens is trees start to establish on the landscape based on their shade tolerance. So at first we'll have a very open environment where we'll primarily have shrub species, plant trees, plant species, um, mosses, uh, actually mosses don't come till later, but some of these what we call shade intolerant species of trees, which are aspen, balsam fir, 
white birch. So these trees that come up and are able to tolerate a large amount of sunlight. And then as we as the stand gets older, the shade tolerance basically goes up. So what we're looking at in a young forest or a mature forest is more intermediate to mid shade tolerant species. So we start seeing species like red oak and white pine being a larger component of the landscape. Finally, once we get to climax forest or old growth forest, we have more red spruce, hemlock, uh, sugar maple. So these species that really only grow under shady conditions. So these, this is kind of the key to understanding forest succession or how forests regenerate following disturbances. So when we're operating within the community forest, we're only operating in mature forests. Um, all of our old growth is largely left untouched. There's sometimes remnants within forest stands where we're operating, but those we don't operate in. Um, and then we are trying to replicate the disturbance that would occur in these mature or old forests. So these are largely partial harvests um, that would be promoting shade tolerant species. So I hope that makes sense for everyone. <coughs> so just tying back to what is natural, now that we have a bit of a background on succession, I wanted to point out an interesting study done on neighboring Kejimakujik. Because Keji is so close by to us, it's a great resource for some of the research that they've done on the area, um, and especially in terms of these carbon soil carbon dating of how natural disturbances occurred on the landscape. Um, so Elena Ponomarenko has done a lot of this research and in her 2009 study, she kind of pointed out that hemlock used to be a much more dominant tree on the landscape, however, has largely disappeared from the area following an increase in fire frequency from European colonization. So this is largely due to that, that slash and burn agriculture that we saw happening in early settlement. So because hemlock is a shade tolerant species, it generally has become minimized on the landscape as more of these intense, high-frequency, large-scale fire events occurred on the landscape. So what we see now is a greater dominance of early successional species like balsam fir, red maple, black spruce, and white birch. And the photo on the right is taken within the Medway community forest. It's not like these don't exist anymore, these kind of characteristic Acadian forest stands. It's just they're less prevalent on the landscape. And we see more of the photo on the right, which is these spruce pine forests that are characterized by red maple, white pine, red oak, and species that wouldn't necessarily be considered climax in the Acadian forest of the past. So it becomes a little philosophical in this whole approach, but we we're really trying to kind of move things towards what we know would have been a characteristic Acadian forest. So now we have to take all of this in into consideration in developing our harvest prescriptions. So first we have to have, we have this challenge of determining what is a natural stand condition. And all practitioners should consider successional pathways and then future likely disturbances in individual stands. We also have to consider that the Acadian forest is generally in a stage of restoration and regrowth. It's not in that natural condition that we would have seen pre-settlement. And then we have to think about the best way to mitigate and adapt to changing com conditions, primarily due to climate change, but also encouraging resiliency in the face of forest pests, insects, um, or increased drought, flooding, whatever it may be. So these kind of how we're going to have a huge human impact on the landscape and climate change is really going to influence how we manage our forests in the future. But the underarching principle that we have to consider at all times is that we need to be adaptive and that the forest operations that we do need to be unique and tailored to individual forest stands. So we can't really be prescribing blanket prescriptions. We need to have trained practitioners in the woods 
making decisions on a stand-by-stand -stand basis and really reflecting what is most ecologically appropriate for any given forest stand. So this photo on the right, this is in a sugar maple stand. Um, it looks a little open because it's actually taken from a, a, on a harvesting trail, but this was a 25% removal that we did earlier this year um, to increase light availability for sugar maple, but largely leaving the majority of the stand standing. So then we have to get into the details, get into the science. So we're looking at our overarching dominant natural disturbance pattern. So for this sugar maple stand, that would be wind. Um, and then we're considering some of these more stand level attributes. So we're looking at what is our successional stage? Is this a young forest? Is this a pole age forest? Is it mature or is it old growth? We're looking at the vegetation type, so specifically the species composition. The stand structure, do we have a multi-age forest or an even age forest? When we look back here, this forest was generally even age, so that will imp implicate what prescription you develop as well. And then we have to look at, of course, the shade tolerance. So are these species that are generally dominated by shade intolerant um, or tolerant species? <coughs> So <laughs> I really like these maps. They're taken from a paper that was actually uh, it, done um, in the Acadian Forest Research Program. So it's an actual test site where they test ecological forestry in Maine. I thought the photo on the top kind of looked like a pizza, um, which uh, generally appeals to me. So, so but I think, I think what's really great, what they've represented here, is the time scale in that which ecological forestry occurs. So in the photo on the top, you could see that, the and, and just compared to that little color graph at the bottom, um, oh, I've used the example as the bottom one, but okay, so let's say, so we're looking at image B here. So say this is an older spruce hemlock stand that would naturally be um, influenced by wind. So smaller scale uh, openings that are happening um, following a wind event. So what they're trying to replicate here is these expanding, the, the group in the, in the states are really into these expanding gap harvests. So as you can see, year zero is those smaller red bubbles that are within the, for so the dotted lines, the extraction trail. And then as you go on, so then at year 20, you have another removal that's expanding the gap. Um, so making a larger opening, but it's doing so gradually over time. It's not doing so all at once. So then you can actually, this stand is going to be treated all the way up to year 90. Whereas the stand at the top, that's emulating larger wind events likely, or else insects. So larger disturbances, so you see those gaps are bigger, those red blotches are bigger, and then they're actually only operating to year 40, I guess. So they're not, they're, they'll be doing more intense forestry, but on a shorter time scale. So you have this like difference between the frequency of natural disturbances that's being represented there, as well as the intensity. So what we generally do in our license area to reflect the ecological forestry that's appropriate for our dominant stands, which are spruce pine, um, so dominated by red spruce, white pine, red oak, um, some balsam fir, some white birch, lots of red maple. So these are kind of what we would call mid-successional species. So these irregular shelterwood harvests are an easy way to tailor a prescription to a stand. So generally, we want to improve growing conditions um, for residual trees by removing the most unhealthy or least vigorous trees. So we're never removing the highest quality first. We're always removing the poorest quality stock first. And when I say poorest quality, I'm referring to of course, its value as a future saw log. So we're promoting natural regeneration in these harvests. So because we're creating gaps similar to within the last side, as well as doing some thinning in between the gaps, we're promoting natural regeneration as well as releasing 
what we call, what the foresters call. Um, so we're helping healthy, vigorous stock grow. So we're giving it more light availability into the understory and allowing these stands to grow. And then we also want to limit competition from shade intolerant species. If you open up a stand too much, then you're going to have competition from particularly for us, red maple coppice. Um, so we get shoots coming up from the stump or we have um, aspen coming up in high intensity, iracaceous shrub species, which is our kind of woody shrub species. So blueberry, lamb kill, um, Bracken fern even can cause competition for natural seedlings. So opening up the canopy too much is a bad thing. And we also don't want to encourage any future soil nutrient loss that may be implicated by increasing light availability too much. So this diagram on the right here is from a study by Patricia Raymond, which basically looks at all of the irregular shelterwood systems that occur um, throughout North America. And she's kind of classified them in an interesting way. Um, and we're generally operating in this middle realm, which she's calling continuous cover irregular shelter wood. So we're never removing the overstory of a stand. We're always keeping some canopy cover on, on the top of the stand so that we always have like kind of a legacy. So we have trees for wildlife retention, whatever it may be, while we're cutting trees um, throughout the stand. And it's not to say that you can't cut every tree throughout the stand, uh, you just can't do it all at once. So um, that's generally where we're aiming to operate. So we also have to consider retention following disturbance. So obviously in this photo to the left, there's a lot of retention there that's following in a regular shelterwood harvest. So it kind of just looks, still looks like a forest, but there needs to be some prioritization when you're practicing ecological forestry so that it's reflective of all of the wildlife values that would have existed pre-treatment. Um, so basically, just because a disturbance has altered a landscape doesn't mean the forest has been wiped out. So when we're looking at larger scale disturbances, we need to make sure that we still have a high proportion of downed or standing woody debris, as well as particular trees for retention that will help maintain biodiversity. So the photo to the left was taken um, in that same Seven Mile Lake fire area on our license on our license area. And we can see the sheer volume of trees that were left standing. Mind you, this is pretty near following the fire. So this was probably taken in September, October, 2016, when the fire occurred in August. So I would imagine a lot of those trees would now be fallen over, but there's still a lot of, a lot of complexity in the understory that's gonna be created by all of these trees falling on top of each other. Um, as well as promoting biodiversity through coarse woody debris. And the photo on the right is of course following Hurricane Dorian. And an interesting thing um, with wind disturbances is when we have these large uprootings of trees, those also create additional um, diversity on the forest floor. So what we call pit and mound topography. So it's creating these hummocks over time that help encourage soil health, particularly as the wood decays. So we can largely say that clear cutting that removes absolutely everything probably doesn't best emulate large scale disturbances because as we can see here, there's always some consideration for retention. So we need to know what trees to prioritize for retention before we go in to do a harvest. Um, and particularly the department has come out recently with new interim retention guidelines that are actually really well summarized um, what trees to retain following harvest. So they've categorized it in no particular order, I believe, as com uncommon tree species, um, so ironwood, anyone that any one tree that you wouldn't commonly find in a stand, those are obviously high priority for retention. Wildlife trees and biodiversity features, um, 
appropriate or high quality growing stock and advanced regeneration, which are LIT species means that long lived tolerant shade tolerant species that are in good form. Then deep rooted species um, that can basically stay standing are wind firm. So if another disturbance were to occur, um, they would stay standing. So sugar maple, yellow birch, white pine, red oak, white ash would all be good examples of that. And I think these are in summary based on how, how they're listed here. Then I guess you would have shallow rooted overstory species of wind, wind firm long term long lived species. So red spruce, eastern hemlock, white spruce, red maple would be less wind firm than the species before. And then finally just some overstory species that are relatively deep rooted. So right there we have red pine, jack pine, and white birch. So I encourage you all once I send the presentation to take a look at the interim retention guides. They're a little technical, but it's a good way to understand um, some of the features that we want to be enduring over time. And then of course the, the forest biodiversity stewardship guide is a great resource to actually determining some of these wildlife trees and biodiversity features. And I'm just going to talk about a few of those right now. Um, so our primary, our primary objective in preserving wildlife trees generally when I'm on site and picking retention trees is cavity trees. And I've picked all of these cute animals to showcase how important they are, um, especially at this time of year when we have a lot of birds nesting or animals keeping their young um, in, in cavity trees. So generally um, we aim for a post-harvest uh, retention of a minimum of eight to tr 10 trees per hectare. And, and then we're generally trying to promote live trees with cavities rather than dead standing snags. Um, although standing snags have a lot of value as coarse woody debris, live trees are generally seen as better for wildlife and biodiversity. So there's a variety of different cavities, including roost cavities. Those are really high priority for retention. So those are for <coughs> colonies of birds. And we have nest cavities. So that would be for swallows um, or as we see <laughs> on the bottom right, the adorable wood ducks. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of the videos of the wood ducks making their descent onto the forest floor and they can actually nest remarkably far away from water. So you may not have a water body very close to your, for, to your operating area, but you could still find a wood duck in a, in a, in a cavity tree. Next, we're thinking about escape cavities. So those are ones that are actually on the forest floor level. So um, in the photo on the top right, we have an escape cavity. So it's something where an animal can just duck in if um, it's being chased by a predator. And then of course, feeding cavities. So those are largely on dead, dead or declining trees um, where we see woodpeckers making kind of less deep cavities that can actually be used for nesting, but are of course like good, good indicators of species richness within the area. Another key biodiversity feature is mass trees. Um, so we don't have an extensive list of mass species in Nova Scotia, but if there are mass trees on your woodlot or in your operating area, it's really important to retain again, 10 or eight to 10 trees a hectare. So we have two types of mass. So there's hard mast and soft mast. And the main two species producing hard mast in Nova Scotia are beech and oak. And then we have our soft mast species. So we're talking about eating catkins or berries or different things on the tree, but it's not actually hard nut. So the hard nut has the most nutritional value for any bird or mammal species, whereas the soft mass has less nutritional value, but can be just as important for biodiversity. So we have birch, ironwood, cherry, so both black and pin cherry, mountain ash, and then of course, a plethora of understory shrub species like blueberry, serviceberry, raspberry. So. Uh, this is a photo of a bare nest in a mature beech tree. 
So these are really awesome if you ever come across a beach stand. A lot of the times I've seen these in our license area. Maybe a little scary when you're in between a, a whole stand of beech trees that all have bear nests in them. But basically what the bears do is they reach to the upper canopy, eat the beech nuts in a mast year. Not every year is a mast year, but eat the beech nuts off the tree and then basically just start making these piles of sticks um, in the tree and they create these like padded down nests um, that are very easy to spot because they're just massive. Um, so beech is a really important species to continue to preserve on our landscape because of the mast value. And there are plenty more wildlife features. Again, that biodiversity guide is a really great, has a lot of really great examples of other biodiversity features um, that you have on, on all forest areas in Nova Scotia. So top left, uh, super canopy trees. So those are really essential for some uh, nesting raptors like bald eagles. Um, so creating a high perch and, and these trees are usually extending beyond the dominant canopy. So, you know, we're talking 22 meter white pines, that type of thing. White pine's really the dominant super canopy tree here. Elsewhere, for further south, you see a lot of basswoods, so some of these tall um, deciduous tree seeds, even aspen could be a super canopy tree here in Nova Scotia, though. And then we also want to consider, are there any special management zones or special management practices that we need to encourage within the area, so moose being one, do we need to retain um, a high level of continuous forest cover within the stand. So actually excluding an area from, even if it is a partial harvest, excluding some of that area to keep as natural so that moose or other species would have continuous forest cover. And then of course, coarse woody debris is a really essential part of preserving biodiversity, as I've mentioned earlier. Um, especially if your stand is even aged or doesn't necessarily have that buildup of windfall over time. Um, a lot of woodlot owners are constantly cleaning up their woodlots and taking away their windfall, but of course woody debris plays an absolutely integral part of maintaining biodiversity, um, both for soil health, habitat, uh, many, many features within stands can be preserved um, just based on the retention of course woody debris. And within that biodiversity guide as well, there's targets based on vegetation type. Um, so you could actually look up what type of forest you have and the ideal um, proportion of course woody debris uh, that should be retained. So if you were doing special management and noticed that there wasn't a whole lot of downed woody debris on site, you would probably be taking the steps to work with your operator to make sure that there's an additional um, additional say tops or stumps or trees, actually bowls of trees that are retained post-harvest. So this photo I showed before, but I just wanted to provide some examples of what our forestry operations, so this is what actual ecological forestry looks like on a landscape. Um, so this is an example within a spruce pine stand. This is actually that aerial photo that you saw earlier of the research trial. This is within that site. So this is a spruce pine stand um, that we did a mixture of gap harvests and thinnings um, to basically encourage growth of some of the spruce that was on site, as well as encourage natural regeneration of the pine. And then this is another spruce pine site, though quite a bit different in species composition. And here we opened up the canopy quite a bit more. Um, so this is a dominant pine stand. And I think I mentioned earlier, the pine is a mid shade tolerant species. So it can tolerate quite a bit more light than say red spruce can or Eastern hemlock. So when you open up the canopy, say, you know, here's probably 40 to 45%. Um, we have an increased likelihood that we're going to have good natural regeneration for pine being established. So the one thing about pine is although it responds well to light availability, to increased light availability, we have a huge problem with the white pine weevil here in Nova Scotia. So if you open up the canopy too much, 
then you start getting a risk of the leaders actually being munched down by the white pine weevil. And that significantly affects um, the future quality or saw log potential of a pine tree in the future. Here's a mixed wood stand. So you could see some poplar, some oak, uh, some pine in this stand, and then you see some snags that are retained. And again, this is more of a mid shade tolerant stand condition. So I believe this was opened up to about 30 to 40 percent. Um, so sorry, taken, we took back the canopy about 34 percent. So about uh, seven, 70 to 60% of the stand was retained. And this is actually within a gap, um, this photo was taken. So we have here, ideally the poplar probably would be harvested because likely at that maturity level. So that's the tree that's to the right is the poplar and then to the left is the oak. That tree's likely at the end of its life, but there is not a whole lot of market value for harvesting poplar. So we might as well leave it standing because it's eventually gonna decline and provide probably provide habitat um or else that coarse woody debris has a lot of value within the landscape and then finally sorry this this is a little bit blurry because i took it off a of video is that example of tolerant hardwood and it looks quite a bit more open than it actually is because of the lack of leaves on the trees but um, this was a 25% removal that we're emulating uh, actually a selection harvest. So this isn't, this isn't any regular shelter wood. I didn't really get into selection harvests much today, but this is um, your primary uh, harvest technique in hardwood stands. So you're trying to improve future saw log quality. So it's less of a regenerating. So you're not trying to regenerate trees as much as you're trying to release or grow the trees that are are retained post-harvest. So one thing I just wanna close with is it's really important to maintain and this idea of stand heterogeneity is so important to ecological forestry. So we wanna maintain a diversity and a complexity in every which way possible. And this is to promote adaptability and resiliency. So basically the way I like to think about this is we never know what future forest markets are going to look like. We never know what species are going to be in demand. We also don't know what are the next forest pests that are going to be attacking individual tree species. So we want to make sure that we're managing for a diversity of ages, species, and then maintaining a structural and vertical diversity. So this is really integral to having a diversity of species. Um, so we're maintaining different variations in heights within the stand. So this is what we, this vertical diversity is if you think about it as, as a variety of different ages. So both of these photos do show good vertical diversity, but in this untreated tolerant hardwood stand on the left, we really see a large variations of ages. So we see some big, big legacy trees as well as some smaller trees that are just regenerating. Whereas we have the treated tolerant hardwood stand that's even aged and we can see um, doesn't have that same level of diversity. So if you have an even aged stand with only one species, that's not gonna be as adaptive to climate change um, as an untreated stand or a uneven aged stand would be. It's not to say that necessarily untreated or treated would um, increase your adaptability adaptability, but you need to just be taking this into great consideration when you're developing harvest prescriptions. So it's basically an insurance plan is how I like to think of it. And, the, and it mitigates these future changes in social and environmental conditions. And just to talk briefly about climate change, um, we are going to see an increased frequency of climatic extremes over the next century um, and that we need to consider that these rising temperatures are going to significantly affect the species that grow here in the Acadian forest. We're in a unique position because we have um, uh, a co forest composition that's comprised of species that are both at their northern and southern extents of their natural ranges, so it actually puts a lot of risk on our natural forest species. But this is taken from another study from Anthony Taylor that was released via the Canadian Forest Service that basically is projecting the impacts of climate change 
So we can see on the left there is the current forest composition in the Acadian forest. And, and mind you, this is considering New Brunswick as well. So this might not be reflective as the forest you see in your backyard, but overall, this is what we're seeing. Um, and the current forest composition is too, you know, also we have to consider it's reflective of those centuries of human influence. Um, but we see a huge flux. So when you see the projected forest composition, so RCP 8.5, that's basically his most dramatic climate model that he created in this study. So we see a huge shift from um, balsam fir, black spruce, uh, more dominant um, coniferous boreal species and a shift to red maple really taking over on this landscape in yellow birch. And I would assume within that other category would be white pine and red oak. That's what's going to be happening in the landscape in our backyard is we're going to see a decline in balsam fir, black spruce, red spruce and an increase in red oak and white pine, which are largely opportunistic species and will take advantage of that open niche in between shade intolerant and shade tolerant species. So just to wrap up, and again, I'm going to circulate this presentation. I've, I've come up with a bit of a reading list for any of you keeners who really want to get into the the deep dive of ecological forestry. Um, the books here, Critique of Silviculture Managing for Complexity, that's been a book I've referred to for the past 10 years or so um, that I originally got when I was doing graduate studies. Um, but it's a great resource for just that case for adaptability and resiliency. And then there's some papers as well, as well, which I can actually, because papers I know aren't easy for the public to access, but if anyone is interested in obtaining those, um, I can send them to you as well. So thanks and I'll now take questions. I will see if I can escape screen sharing and give it back to you, Hiba. Hello. Um... Thank you, Mary Jane, for the great presentation. So um, we have two questions. Um, so the first one is in regards to pests, how about the emerald ash borer? Yeah, that's definitely a risk too. Um, EAB has been, and Heba, you actually probably know more about EAB than I do. Um, Heba did her honors research on EAB, but uh, the one thing I think about EAB is it's a huge risk for street trees, especially in urban areas, but ash isn't a dominant tree on our landscape. Um, and I, I've been kind of thinking that maybe it wouldn't move as, as, as quickly through our, our Nova Scotia landscape as it has through Ontario, where ash is a really dominant species within forests. I don't know, Heba, do you have any insights on that? Um, yeah, actually. So the way that the emerald ash borer moves um, is it will travel about one kilometer um, on its own. But if it's going to move any long distances, that would be through firewood. So if you're taking like um, ash firewood and it has emerald ash borer, you take it to a stand. That's how it'll spread mostly. Um, so the nature of its spread um, doesn't really facilitate movement in rural forests where, you know, you're not really moving around too many stands. Um, the other aspect about that as well is um, from, so my honor thesis was looking at the spread, the distribution of ash. So about 2% of our forests are actually ash. Um, so again, it's, it's at such a low percentage that it's just, it's highly unlikely that it would affect the rural forest um, in to a large extent. Um, but then the urban forest, that's a whole different deal where it will yeah. probably affect it much more. Our second question is, um, just one second, what is fireproofing a forest and is it recommended? Right, so fireproofing a forest that's more <laughs> done in the west um so that's typically where you're clearing a lot of the understory vegetation that's not particularly vigorous um so it's losing 
fuel that will kind of send the fire straight straight through the landscape. So if you if you're kind of um, removing a lot of under understory vegetation or declining understory vegetation, especially in coniferous stands, then that's not going to allow the fire to move through the landscape as quickly. Fire is really driven by the ability and, and obviously happens in dry conditions of, of the ability for it to move through dry landscapes and dry instances of woody debris or um, or duff or whatever it may be, like kind of that organic forest layer. So that's what you would be referring to as cleaning the forest, though it's not it's not really an essential fireproofing mechanism. I don't think there's any recommendations for actually doing so in Nova Scotia because that's not really how our forests grow here. Um, so our third question is, um, in light of the climate crisis, does ecological forestry address maximizing carbon sequestration of forests? Yes, it does. Um, so basically, ecological forestry um, and even like the forestry that's more tailored to producing higher quality saw logs is aligned with carbon sequestration. So when I talk about releasing trees is we have smaller diameter trees that are being suppressed under a canopy. So if you remove say a declining older tree, like not of a huge diameter, but something that's in kind of the middle of the diameter spectrum um, that's blocking that younger tree, that younger tree will then have time to grow. And that's what we call improved forest management. So you're improving the quality of the growing stock as well as providing an opportunity for the carbon to actually grow. So the bole of the tree, the trunk, which stores the most carbon is actually increasing in size. So I can send a link of uh, improved forest management as well for anyone who's interested. Okay, great. Um, so another question. Um, so in regards to the inter interim retention guidelines, um, do these apply only to clear cuts? What about irregular shelter wood? Are there different retention requirements for irregular shelter wood? So the new interim retention guidelines, um, those are primarily for the new variable retention harvest. So those are the harvests that are really the new kind of alternative to clear cut harvesting. Um, though I believe the retention guidelines will be implemented um, on irregular shelter woods, but because irregular shelter woods aren't a formal prescription right now within the forest management guides, um, I can't quite answer that question, but I assume that hopefully there will be some requirements for, for retention within irregular shelter woods as well. Great. Great. Um, so given the benefits mass trees bring with regards to ecology and the resilience brought by increased diversity, what is the MCFC's position regarding introducing introducing trees of southwestern Carolinian forests like butternut, black walnut, and bur oak? Yeah, I think that, so we refer to this, that um, movement of species by humans as it's called assisted migration. And it's definitely something I'm really interested in, um, particularly for just growing tree standpoint rather than biodiversity that though it's completely applicable to that too um there it has been tested uh particularly bc has done a lot of work with the system migration but i don't think it's been done much at all in nova scotia um one particularly interesting um kind of climate adaptive management approach is this is kind of aside from assisted migration is taking um, trees that are from more southerly areas for their genotype. So basically, if you have a red spruce from Maine, it's going to be more adaptive to southern conditions than a red spruce that would occur naturally in Nova Scotia. So 
moving those genotypes of different species to more northerly climates to reflect the changing climate. I think that that's probably more realistic how we're going to go in the near future, but I'm definitely interested in, in looking at assisted migration for, for wildlife values too. And trees like butternut or basswood, there is some question of whether those would have been on the landscape pre-settlement anyways. I mean, butternut has been largely eradicated by pests. Um, so there, you know, introducing resilient species could, could be a question there. Um, but, but it would definitely be interesting to test that. Great. Um, so we have one last question. Um, can you speak to some of the challenges facing the rest of the forestry industry in terms of implementing ecological forestry practices? Yeah, well, I, I definitely can't speak for the entire forestry industry, but there's definitely, um, some challenges associated with um, economics and implementing ecological forestry. There is, you know, there are instances where ecological forestry and selection harvests pay, um, and and generally that's seen over time. So the sh the short term is where our challenge is. It's because we're doing harvest practices that take out the poorest quality growing stock that right now we don't really have markets for in Nova Scotia. So we're talking about pulpwood, firewood we do have a market for, um, but as particularly in the Southwest, we don't really have anywhere to send our declining balsam fir. Um, so that definitely presents a challenge in executing these type of prescriptions. So we're looking to be as innovative as possible in finding markets for those products, um, particularly in looking at some small scale biomass um, or biochar or some of these. The department is working on a lot of these things um, as finding new markets are really, really important. Um, another thing is training, um, training contractors to execute these harvests will be a huge undertaking. Um, in Ontario, they practice primarily tree marking, which is something that I'm a huge advocate for. Um, so they do tree marking both for the removal of species as well as to retain species. I think it's particularly important in both those aspects, but if we're implementing these interim retention guides, we need to be able to uh, best represent what is the primary species or, or trees for retention. So having a trained practitioner go out and mark in blue paint what trees absolutely cannot be taken out of a stand is will be really, really important. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, we have another question. Have you experimented with any unconventional planting strategies? Would planting be useful to help propagate shade tolerant species? Yeah, so we are, we're actually um, looking at starting to do some research trials with some different planting techniques coming up in the next year. Um, so I don't know the details yet of that project, but it's going to be really interesting. Um, the most experimentation we've done to date have been, we, we have a bit of a red oak planting project here. Um, red oaks significantly um, affected by deer browse, um, particularly in the Southwest. So although red oak's pretty easy to regenerate, it doesn't often reach maturity because of the volume of deer in our area. Um, so there's been some studies, like the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute has done some studies um, of actually implementing physical barriers to limit deer browse. Um, but we've just <laughs> kind of been throwing them in on the landscape, like we put in quite a few in our burn site. Um, and then I think in the future, we're gonna be planting some in uh, some of the patch, the gap harvests um, to just to promote red oak as a species, because it's likely gonna take a much more prevalent role on the landscape as the climate changes. And then again, has that mass quality that's really important. Yeah. Um, so I think with that, we have no more questions left. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining in. Um, 
we have other webinars in this series. So um, the next one in the series is on the 23rd. Um, so it's on uh, forest plant identification. We have another webinar next week um, with Peter Junker on environmental assessment and forestry. Um, so, so great to have everyone join us. Um, and if you're still interested, we're running these webinars um, really every week or quite a bit until August. Um, and keep checking out the website, of course, because that's where we're going to post all the new speakers. Um, with that, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.